welcome Dr. McCurry. Thank you very much, Dr. Cochran. So uh, I want to start out by saying it's a great pleasure to be here today. This is really a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I have to say presenting in this modality, however, is new to me. I typically am a pretty enthusiastic speaker. I tend to use my hands a lot. I pace and I'm not able to do that today. I also tend to get talking pretty fast. So I'm going to deliberately try to slow myself down just in case folks are having any transmission problems as a part of this presentation. So if we, if we start out, we're talking today about evidence-based practices for the care of people with dementia. And my talk is really going to be focused on neuropsychiatric behaviors. And we know that Alzheimer's disease and dementia, you know, affects many older adults who are the fastest growing segment of our population and that families provide the bulk of care for these older persons with dementia. Uh, there are certainly many people who wind up going into long-term care facilities, but as long as possible, most people prefer to stay on their, in their own home with support of family and friends. And various mood and behavior challenges, problems are the main reason that families become unable to provide care. So these mood and behavior problems, they significantly and adversely affect both the persons with dementia You're a little bit paused, Sue. Confusion or risk for falls or even paradoxical responses to what they're supposed to accomplish. They can be expensive and they don't solve the underlying problem, whatever's causing the mood or behavioral disturbance in the first place. On the other hand, non-pharmacological or behavioral treatments can be individualized to each person. So whatever is the particular situation that's going on in the home that needs addressing, you can tailor your interventions to those specific needs. They are very empowering for caregivers. Once a caregiver understands that he or she has skills that can be helpful in relieving mood and behavior problems in the person they're caring for, they can feel really empowered. Uh, it helps them see the big picture. Sometimes we all get focused when we're having difficulty with someone or a situation. We, we get kind of tunnel vision and we get focused on this particular problem and don't look at sort of what's the context in which it's occurring and how might that be influenced its occurrence or, or not. And behavioral treatments are useful at every stage of disease. So they can be helpful in the beginning when someone is first starting to have problems with memory. They're uh, useful in middle stages of disease when problems are increasing and even at later stages of disease when people are fairly advanced in their neuropsychiatric symptoms or their cognitive decline. So the um, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality last year came out with a document and the URL, the link is on this slide that you can access it and download this PDF for free yourself. And it talks about when we look at care interventions, there's really four different levels of care that we as, as human beings need to be thinking about. There's societal policy levels of change, interventions that need to happen. We need to look at organizational sort of service organizations, how those are providing respite or support to family members who need to provide care for family members. Uh, looking at social and community level of care. Uh, is there, are there family, are there neighbors, are there friends? Is there uh, people outside of the one individual who's identified as the primary caregiver at home. And then there's the individual, the persons who are living with dementia themselves and the individual care receivers. What kind of help do they need? All four of these levels are very important 
Act for Good Care. But today, I'm just going to be focusing on the individual level. There are a lot of individual non-pharmacological slash behavioral treatment options out there. I did a, just a quick search looking at PubMed a week or so ago, found 44 articles when I put in the search terms dementia or Alzheimer's and evidence-based and non-pharmacological and treatment or intervention. If I expanded it out and looked at randomized controlled trials, I got up to 76 articles. Uh, when I started looking at review and meta-analyses for non-pharmacological or treatment and intervention articles for dementia or Alzheimer's got up to 221. If I had added in the word behavioral or caregiver, the numbers would have been much greater still. So I point this out to you to let you know that I'm going to be talking about one evidence-based approach to dementia care today that was developed here at University of Washington. But we are not the only game in town. And many of the other options that are out there share some common components with what we'll be talking about today. But I do think it's useful for you to get kind of a little bit deeper dive into understanding one particular treatment approach that we've been using now for 20 years and have found extremely helpful. Uh, if you are interested in some of these other programs, I invite you to look at this particular searchable database that was just posted in 2020. Uh, it's spearheaded by Dr. Katie Maslow at the uh, Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging in association with the Family Caregiver Alliance. And it's very, it's free. It's very user accessible. You can go in and search for the kind of program you're looking for. Uh, they'll give you information about where it's available, a little bit about the programs. So really, I, I suggest you take a few minutes after this talk, look up this link and spend some time searching around to see what might be available near you and what might catch your eye. I'd also encourage anyone who hasn't already done so to be sure and book link the uh, NIH uh, National Institute of Aging site on Alzheimer's and caregiving for a continually updated set of resources about everything related to living with dementia, diagnosis, caregiving, treatment options, or clinical trials. So if you're not already going to this site often to see what's new there, I'd encourage you to be sure and look at it. And lastly, I've listed here just a few key reviews and reports that have come out in recent years. Again, this is not by any means an exclusive list, but I want to do due diligence in acknowledging all the many people who are out there working and, and coming up with excellent uh, standards of care, standards for research interventions for persons with dementia and their, and their caregivers just sort of state-of-the-art thinking. And, and again, just take a look, open up these reports. They are all available to you for free online uh, with the possible exception of the Lancet article. And uh, it may also be available through PubMed. So um, if, if it's not and you're affiliated with the university, you can likely get it there. So today we're gonna be talking about a program called Star Caregivers. I mentioned earlier, this is a program that was developed at University of Washington. There were three of us that were involved, uh, Dr. Linda Terry, myself, and Dr. Rebecca Logston. Uh, we three were faculty members that worked together for the Northwest Research Group on Aging for many years. And uh, this was one of the programs that came out of that work. And these are just three of the published papers that one can find online describing the work. And I'll be talking in great detail about STAR-C as we go along here. So STAR-C is one of what we call the Seattle Protocols that started back in the 1980s. The very first Seattle Protocol intervention was for treatment of depression in persons with dementia. 
persons with Alzheimer's disease specifically. Uh, Dr. Linda Terry was the principal investigator on a grant from the National Institute of Mental Health, funded at that time. And this study was the first randomized trial that I'm aware of in the literature that provided behavioral treatment to people with Alzheimer's disease with depression to see whether behavioral treatments could improve depression symptoms in these individuals. <clears throat> and at that time, uh, depression was considered uh, really to be sort of an uh, inevitable sequela of developing Alzheimer's disease. Uh, some of that thinking was a bit cynical. The idea, I think, was, well, if you had Alzheimer's disease, wouldn't you be depressed? <laughs> some of it was just um, really not understanding, you know, the, the way very well that the disease processes moved forward. But, but at the time, if someone was showing symptoms of depression and they had Alzheimer's disease, medication management was really the standard of care. So what Dr. Terry did was she introduced or developed this treatment protocol, which uh, became the basis for a series of studies that were done over the years by our research group, first with depression, but then later looking at treatment of agitation, uh, looking at working with people with early stage memory loss, with physical inactivity, with sleep problems, dealing with people who were in adult family homes, in assisted living settings, in nursing homes, as well as in community settings. But this depression treatment study in 1988 provided the foundation, and it's the basis of the core components of these Seattle protocols that are at the heart of the STAR Caregivers program as well that we're talking about today. So what is STAR Caregivers or STAR-C? So in Star C, we're working specifically with the family members of persons with dementia. This is unlike some in-home interventions where we are more tailored working one-on-one uh, -on -one with the person with cognitive decline or impairment themselves. Uh, in this case, we are focused on the family members, but we want them to learn to be an agent of change for the person with dementia and for themselves. We want to support caregivers as they're implementing these new strategies and interventions. We want to help them learn to take good care of themselves and to teach them practical strategies based on these five core principles of good dementia care that are the underpinnings of all the Seattle protocols. So these are these five core components and we're gonna revisit them again and again in the remainder of the time we have today. Uh, we talk about dementia education and realistic expectations with caregivers. We teach them strategies for good communication. We teach them an approach to behavioral problem solving that we call the ABCs of behavior change. We encourage them to increase the occurrence of pleasant events for the person they're caring for and for themselves, and to be sure they're taking good care of themselves, both physically and emotionally, so that they can provide the support that they want to be able to give to the person they're caring for. So the original randomized trial for STAR-C was published back in the mid-2000s, and it included 95 caregiver and care receiver dyads. And these dyads were randomized to either receive STAR-C or to receive just routine medical care, whatever treatment they were getting as part of their normal primary care at the time. It was eight weekly in-home sessions plus four monthly follow-up calls. Uh, we did assessments at baseline, at two-month post-test, <clears throat> at six-month follow-up, and as in a good research study, a, a randomized trial, our interviewers were blind to treatment conditions. The results of that first randomized trial showed a lot of caregiver effects. We saw significant decreases in depression in caregivers, in their self-reported burden levels for those who received STAR-C versus the routine care. We saw caregivers reporting increased quality of life. They felt like their lives were just better. Over time, well, what we also saw, which isn't showing, oops, 
which, oops, oh my goodness, how did I do that? Let me go back to where I meant to be. So what isn't on this slide, but the results that we also saw were, we asked caregivers at the start of the STAR-C program to identify one to three particular behavior challenges that they were personally experiencing with the person they were caring for. So these were items, these were things that might not show up on a depression questionnaire or a behavior problem and agitation rating scale. They were things that were very idiosyncratic and personal to the persons, you know, who we were talking to. And we asked them to rate how often those problems occurred in the past week, and when they occurred, how bothersome they were to the caregivers. And then we repeated those ratings after the sixth session. And we also saw significant reductions in both frequency and in disturbance, caregiver disturbance by these ratings, uh, which is again not shown on this slide. So over time, like I said, this was the mid, you know, 2005 when this randomized trial was published. Over the past 15 years, the STAR-C program has, has, we've continued to evolve. So it used to be eight weekly in-person sessions. <clears throat> the standard way it's currently delivered in person now is four in-person sessions over six weeks with two phone calls in the middle at weeks three and five. So this reduced travel burden, which was very important to many of our partners who lived in rural areas and uh, who had large caseloads, for example, people in the area agencies of aging who were not able to travel long distances every week for an hour to meet with people. And it also uh, reduced some burden for caregivers who didn't have to have someone coming into their home so frequently. The original random trial, randomized trial was done in Seattle and was tested with predominantly white and highly educated individuals. We know that there are many sociocultural factors that can impact both diagnosis and treatment. There are literacy and reading skills when we're doing an intervention and giving materials to caregivers. There are vast cultural differences in how dementia symptoms are understood and what uh, families expect of one another. <clears throat> and so STAR-C now is actually available and we have trained coaches to deliver the program in Spanish, Russian, Vietnamese, and Chinese, as well as in English. So this slide just shows uh, some of the Washington and Oregon State area agencies on aging that we've worked with over the past years. Um, the, the Oregon studies were where we began first working with AAAs. Dr. I mean, Jennifer Mead, who was a master's, working with the administration on aging. Uh, working with the administration on aging got funding to do a translation study of star C in Oregon from 2009 and 2013. Uh, the, the Multnomah and Rogue Valley Council were involved at that time. Uh, Washington State started implementing star C in its area agencies on aging in 2011. They have never done their implementation as part of a grant. It's always just been programmatic monies that state of Washington have funneled into the, the AAAs to uh, support them and their caregiver programs to offer star C to appropriate dyads. Uh, Jennifer Mead in Oregon got additional funding and uh, 2018 so that she could develop these uh, manuals for the different languages that I just talked about, Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, Russian, and that we could then go down and train coaches and help get them certified to offer Star C in these different languages to their cultural communities. Uh, there's also been funding that's been recently given to the state of Illinois uh, to one of their AAAs to start developing Star C and integrating it with some home-based technology like uh, your your uh, oh, I'm I'm blocking on the name of, of the Alexa kinds of devices and and so they are going to be uh, they they were supposed to be running that grant now but it's been put on hold because of the COVID nineteen pandemic but they are they're getting ready and eager to start doing that program. 
This slide just shows you some of the data from Washington and Oregon over the past years. So uh, they're from 178 diets that we received data from. Remember I mentioned that we asked caregivers to identify one to three problems and to describe how often those problems have happened in the past week and how bothersome, how much, you know, how much disturbed they were by the problems when they occurred, and then to re-rate those problems again at session six. And we can see that of 178 dyads with over, you know, 450 problems, that there have been significant decreases in both frequency and disturbance or reaction, caregiver reactions. And we can also see that this is a rating we ask coaches, Star C coaches who are offering the intervention to caregivers, how helpful they think Star C was to this particular caregiving dyad after the treatment is all done. And the vast majority of coaches feel like Star C has been helpful to their clients. So let's talk about some, what some of these Star C car, core components are. <clears throat> the first one I mentioned is dementia education and realistic expectations. We really want to work with caregivers to help them understand that dementia is a brain disease and that people who are living with dementia do not have control over their changes in thinking and behavior. And some of you might be thinking, well, this is obvious, everyone knows that. But in fact, when you've been living with someone for a long time and their changes have been gradual and some of the symptoms that they're exhibiting might have been symptoms that they showed at times in other ways in their past life. Uh, for example, someone might be quite depressed now and maybe this individual had a history of depression. And so, or maybe this person is, um, seems to be kind of controlling, they're willful, they don't like being told what to do. And, and maybe they've never liked being told what to do. So it's easy for people when you're really close to someone who has a, a progressive brain disease to lose sight of the fact that they are having changes that are going on in their brain that make it more difficult for them to uh, understand the implications of what they say and do, to deliberately try to um, you know, use their behavior to manipulate other people, uh, to, they, they might have decreased impulse control or more difficulty initiating activity or maintaining activity. We, we really want caregivers to understand that it, it, it's true, this disease happens in the context of a person who had a personality before they developed a brain disease, but there still are changes that are happening that are causing the individual to lose intentional control over many of these symptoms that they're showing. We want caregivers to understand about disease progression uh, we don't in Star C talk a lot about stages of dementia because stage theories of dementia are tricky. Uh, lots of people have symptoms from more than one stage and sometimes people will develop symptoms that look like they're getting worse and then things will get better again for a while. But we do want caregivers to understand that over time things are likely to get worse and the person with cognitive decline is going to need more help and the caregiver is going to need to change the strategies that they are using to make the situation work for them. So uh, a, a behavior approach, uh, you know, a, a communication strategy that works well when a person is experiencing very mild symptoms of decline might need to be modified when someone is more moderately or severely impaired. And so caregivers um, need to sort of understand that that's gonna happen, but at the same time, it's not likely to happen quickly unless a person has a, a stroke or develops a significant infection. The decline's more likely to be fairly gradual and uh, we're not able to predict how long that's going to be. So we just want people to sort of see the big picture, things are going to get worse, but they're not going to get worse overnight. And if that happens, you need to 
get the person you're caring for in the position to find out what's gone wrong. Uh, we want caregivers to understand that dementia symptoms are highly variable. <clears throat> There's sort of an old joke among some of my friends that if you've seen one person with Alzheimer's disease, you've seen one person with Alzheimer's disease. And that's not really so surprising because, again, uh, these diseases happen in the context of people who have their own histories, their own life experiences, their own personalities, they're in unique environmental living situations currently, they have medical conditions that may or may not be impacting what's going on. And so the fact that Aunt Agnes was, you know, a certain way when she got Alzheimer's disease does not mean that your husband's going to be that way. Everybody's different. That it is typical for symptoms to wax and wane. I know if I wake up in the morning and, you know, I've got a stomach flu, I'm not going to be as cheerful or as cognitively sharp as I am on the days that I'm healthy. And that's true for someone with dementia as well. If they're not feeling well, if they are, you know, in pain from, say, their osteoarthritis, or sometimes if they're going to the doctor <clears throat> or their cousin they haven't seen for two years is in town for an hour and drops by the house, they might be able to actually kind of hold things together and look pretty good for that time. And only when that stressor or that opportunity to rise to the situation is removed, do they then sort of sink back? So it can go both ways. People can be worse or better depending upon contextual circumstances. And that's, I think, what's for many caregivers, the thing that's the hardest because you don't know uh, if someone isn't able to uh, figure out how to go to the mailbox and get the mail today, does that mean they're never going to be able to go to the mailbox and get the mail again? And maybe not. You know, people may be uh, able to do things one day that they weren't able to do the day before or vice versa. And so it makes it very difficult for family members to try to figure out how much do you start taking over? How independent do you encourage a person to continue to be? And it also makes it difficult for uh, the caregiver to, again, keep in mind that these progressive symptoms may be due to the brain disease, not just due to a person being petulant or difficult or controlling or whatever uh, is the interpretation the caregiver might want to put on it. The second star C component that we talk about, in addition to just helping caregivers have realistic expectations, and I guess I didn't actually talk specifically about realistic expectations when I was talking about the education part, but that really is part and parcel of it. <clears throat> a, a caregiver, uh, I remember one caregiver telling me uh, when I was out of their home a number of years ago that she was unhappy because her mother was no longer doing the housework. So the caregiver had younger children and had a lot of people to take care of in the house. And she had come to rely upon mom taking care of the dishes and the sweeping and the laundry, which mom was no longer doing. And in this case, that was an unrealistic expectation. You know, mom didn't remember the laundry needed to be done and she didn't necessarily know how to turn the washer on anymore. And she um, didn't know where the mop was to mop the floor. So. Uh, the daughter had to, as she got educated about what the disease process was about, needed to shift her expectations of what she thought mom should be able to do. Okay, so moving into good communication. <clears throat> Star C focuses on looking at both verbal communication and at nonverbal communication. So verbal communication are strategies that probably almost all of you have read about. Uh, they're, they're widely talked about throughout the popular literature and scientific literature for dementia care, uh, asking one statement at a time, uh, simplifying your requests, uh, slowing down your speech, uh, making sure that the person you, you, you're eye to eye with the person and they can hear you, <laughs> you know, you're, you're not on the side that they don't have their hearing aid in, just really maximizing uh, helping the person understand what you're saying to them. 
because as dementia progresses, there is a tendency for people to become less adept with their verbal processing. They can't think as quickly. They can't uh, in, understand, you know, the information that's coming at them if it's presented too swiftly. If there's too much information at one time, they can't remember it. They, they you know, focus on whatever piece they're hearing at the moment and forget what came before. Uh, so these verbal communication strategies are very important. But in Star C, we also talk a lot about nonverbal communication. That I, I would say not just people who are caregivers, but probably all of us often are not in touch with our nonverbal cues that we're giving to people. Uh, you know, what our eye contact is like, our body position and movement, our speech rate and tone. And it can happen that these two things our verbal communication <clears throat> and our nonverbal communication are out of sync with one another. So we ask, we, we try to teach caregivers to think about is your verbal and nonverbal communication sending the same message? And so, for example, a caregiver said to me once that the night before, uh, she and her husband had been having dinner and she had served him minestrone soup. And the kitchen where they ate their meals in had a white floor, which she had just mopped that afternoon. And the husband was kind of clumsy with his utensils and he, he was trying to get the spoon in there and bumped the bowl and knocked the bowl of minestrone soup on the white clean kitchen floor. And his wife was telling me this story the next day and she said, you know, I immediately ran over to the sink and I, I got a cloth to wipe it off of him to make sure he wasn't burned. And I got on my knees and I'm trying to mop up this mess. It was like red beans everywhere. And uh, I said to him, I said, Joe, uh, that's all right, honey. Don't worry about it. But her tone of voice was angry she was briskly cleaning up. Her facial expression was intense and irritated. And so what was the message he heard? Did he hear, oh, don't worry about it, it's okay? Or did he hear, you're mad at me? And he didn't really understand why she got upset, but he got upset in return, and they got into an argument. And when she was reflecting on it the next day, she realized, that the cues she had been sending to him had not been, don't worry about it, it's okay. The cues had been, you really messed up and I'm mad at you. And we, we, it, it, this is not to say that you're never gonna get mad at someone you're caring for who has Alzheimer's disease, but you do want to kind of learn to be aware of these mixed messages because in a case where the messages are mixed, it's gonna be the nonverbal signal that gets communicated not the verbal one, and often the nonverbal one, if there's incongruence between them, is um, more angry or sad or frustrated. So you just wanna be aware of that. And we also teach caregivers, you know, the number one rule is just don't argue. Uh, I, I, in my own work, when I, Barb mentioned, I've written a couple of books, and, and my, my approach, personal, in my clinical work, uses the acronym DANCE, D-A-N-C-E, as a way of helping caregivers think about good care. And D stands for don't argue. And I've often said that if you don't remember anything else in the acronym or anything else I've said, if a caregiver remembers this one thing and stops trying to reason, logically convince, you know, uh, show the person why what they're thinking is incorrect or why they shouldn't have done it that way. If they would just give up that, it would in many cases alleviate much of the distress and tension in the home for both of them. Okay, the third star C core component, and again, this is the third component, it's the part of all the Seattle protocols, has to do with teaching caregivers <clears throat> behavioral problem solving strategies of what we call the ABCs of behavior change. So we, uh, Drs. Terry, Loxton, and myself are all 
a clinical psychologist involved in behavioral trained. And we operate from the position that when we say the word behavior, what we mean is that's anything a person does is a behavior. So their external actions, their thoughts, their feelings, all these things are behaviors and everything a person does has meaning and purpose even when these behaviors seem seemingly come out of the blue, come out of nowhere. For the person who is doing or feeling or thinking that, there is some, something in their history or their current environment that uh, gives, gives that behavior, those behaviors, meaning. In Star C, however, we focus not on behaviors like thinking or feelings, but we focus on the behaviors that we can see and count and hear. Things that are in the outside world because a person with dementia may not be able to tell us what they're thinking or feeling. I mean, it could be argued, maybe none of us are very good at that in reality, but, but for people with cognitive impairment, it's particularly important to not rely upon internal experiences for these behavioral interventions, but to focus on what we can see. And, and then we can, when we make an intervention, we can monitor whether our intervention seems to be making a difference or not. <clears throat> and we also focus on improving challenging behaviors by changing the external, physical, and the interpersonal environment. So the kinds of interventions that we focus on are very practical. They're things in the world surrounding the person and surrounding the diet. So STAR C focuses particularly on behaviors that cause a person, a care receiver, to be a danger to his or herself or other people, that interfere with necessary care, or that decrease the care receiver's quality of life or the quality of life of those around him or her. And this bottom one is really important because caregivers are quite different in what is really bothersome to them. Some person might just be driven crazy by constant humming in the person they're caring for. Whereas another caregiver, maybe his hearing isn't so good and she doesn't even hear the humming. So uh, it, it is not only these big dramatic behaviors that we focus on, but also things that are really making it difficult for the dyad to live together in peace and equanimity. So these are just some common examples of the types of behaviors that are observable, you can see and count them. They happen frequently in people with cognitive impairment. And uh, if caregivers say, well, I don't think I have any problems, or I don't think the person I'm caring for has any problems, we can offer them a list like this and just say, well, these are just some examples. Maybe none of them are true for you. But just to give you an idea of the kinds of things that we're thinking of. And star C, ABC approaches can be helpful in figuring out how to make these uh, sometimes challenging behaviors better. So the ABCs, just like that says, the ABCs, <clears throat> we always start, however, with B. We start in the middle. And we encourage people to pick one behavior to work on first. So uh, if I sit down over coffee with my aunt who's caring for her husband and he's got moderately severe Alzheimer's disease, she may tell me a story that lasts 15 minutes of all the things that have been going on that he's been doing. Well, we can't work on all of those things. So we try to pick just one place to start, one behavior to work on first. And then we try to get really concrete about it. What exactly is that person doing? So if my aunt says he doesn't sleep at night, well, that's not very informative. I want to know what does that mean? What, what does I, he doesn't sleep? Is it he doesn't fall asleep? Does it mean he wakes up too early? Does it mean he wants to sleep all day but not at night? Does it mean he falls asleep fine but then he wakes up at two in the morning and, and goes in the kitchen and starts to make breakfast before heading off to work? Well, you know, what specifically does it he doesn't sleep mean. So we try to really get specific so we understand what is the person doing. 
And then we want to know the other W's associated with that. Where does this happen? Uh, who's present when it happens? Sometimes these challenging behaviors uh, work, uh, occur around one individual and not another. You, you see this not infrequently in residential care settings where uh, one staff person has no difficulty assisting a, a resident with a shower and, a, and another staff person just can't get him to go in the shower for anything. So, you know, who's present? These, these are informative data. And when does it happen? You know, does he go happily to the shower if you take him there in the morning, but balks if it's at night? You know, so that, again, this will get into kind of thinking about what are the patterns. And then once we identify what is the specific behavior of interest, we want to ask what happened before that behavior. We want to start with what happened just immediately before the behavior. So if the person is refusing to shower, what happened before uh, he or she was asked to shower? Uh, how were they approached by the caregiver? What tone of voice was used? Uh, how was the request to start the shower uh, brought up? Was it a command? Was it an invitation? Uh, what was the person doing when they were being approached about the shower? Were they engaged in some other activity and just don't want to take a shower right now because they're watching Wheel of Fortune or whatever? So what happened just before? But, but we're also interested if it's available in more historical information. Showering again is a great example. Some people uh, never showered in the morning, only showered at night or vice versa. Some people never showered. Some people always bathed and uh, they won't take a shower now either, but they would be happy, you know, if they were assisted in like a, a bath of some sort. And then we want to look at the C, the consequence. What happens after B? So if the problem is the person's refusing to shower, what does the caregiver do then? So the consequence is really how does the caregiver or the world or other people respond when that behavior occurs? So, you know, does it make the situation worse? Does the caregiver uh, put her hands on her hips and shake her finger and say, you know, you have to shower, you haven't done it in three weeks? Or do they come up with some other approach that seems to make things go more smoothly? <clears throat> Whichever way it is, we are interested in those facts. So what is the specific behavior? You know, where's it happening? Who's present? When is it happening? And what happens before, immediately before first? But also, is there any historical factors that might be relevant? And then consequence, what happens right after? So the reason for using the ABCs, if you can find the right activator, you can sometimes completely stop a behavior problem from occurring. So I had mentioned earlier uh, the example of someone, who, a caregiver who's very disturbed by a care receiver who was humming all the time. That's actually a caregiver I worked with. He was taking care of his mother, adult son. <clears throat> and it just drove him crazy. She hummed constantly. And he discovered that it, it was particularly bad when they were like in a car going somewhere. So he couldn't get away from it by going into a different room. He discovered if he gave his mother some chewing gum when they got in the car to drive to the doctor's office, she wouldn't hum and chew gum at the same time. Now that's, it's a, it's kind of a, a, a frivolous example maybe, but it is an example of how she now had something else to do with her mouth other than humming that kept her from doing that. So if you find the right activator, if you remove what might be a trigger for a behavior, uh, the person getting up and going to the bathroom might not at night put on his shoes and try to exit the house if his shoes are not sitting next to the bed. So uh, those again are examples that can, changing the activator sometimes can eliminate a problem behavior from happening at all. That is not the normal case because behaviors often have a lot of activators. They have lots of things that are part of why they're more likely to occur at one time or the other. And so it's, it's not real common that you can find that magic activator. But by changing your response or the consequence, 
you often can keep a problem behavior from getting worse or continuing. So an example I was giving of someone who's showering, how the caregiver deals with the refusal to shower might mean uh, the situation de-escalates and they're able to redirect the person into a shower after all, or it might cause the situation to become explosive. By changing either activators or consequences, you can sometimes reduce the probability of the problem behavior occurring in the future. So, oops. Uh, I think I have this on a slide later, but I'll mention it now. So, for example, um, we talked about you can reduce the severity and duration of it by changing your response or the consequence. But in some cases, caregivers accidentally reinforce a behavior and increase the likelihood that it's going to happen later. So, for example, might be uh, it's a mom has to go to the doctor. <clears throat> daughter tells mom, let's get in the car. We're going to the doctor. Mom does not want to go to the doctor. She doesn't like to go to the doctor. She gets really upset and starts yelling. And so daughter thinks to herself, you know, it was just a, a checkup for something that I can get done over the phone. And she says to mom, okay, we're not going to go. And she wants to calm mom down. So she offers mom some ice cream. Well, without intending to, daughter may have just uh, inadvertently reinforced uh, getting upset and agitated as a way of getting out of something mom doesn't want to do. And uh, this is can happen particularly with people with dementia if they are in a, a in a in a threat or an anxiety situation or, or where they really want to avoid it they really don't want to be there and by acting a certain way they're removed from it then it it can increase the likelihood that they'll act that way again later so observation is is key to how we find patterns you know, are there days behaviors don't happen? Does it only happen around certain people? Does it only happen on weekends when the kids have come over, the grandkids? Is it more under, likely under certain circumstances? So we really encourage people to kind of be like scientists and, and pay attention, just observe. So these are the four W's, we talked about them. If a caregiver can't describe what happened when a problem, we ask him in the next week to, well, when that problem shows up, let's, let's pay attention to those things and we'll talk more about it next week. This is just a sample of a kind of behavior problem solving form that we use in the STAR C program, where we actually have people write out the behaviors and we write out the activators, what happened before, the consequences, what happened afterwards. And then we're going to really try to help the caregiver do a lot of brainstorming. You know, what are some of the medical, interpersonal, environmental, and historical factors that might be impacting or, or contributing to this behavior occurring? Why is it happening now and it didn't happen on Tuesday? So these are just, again, some of the common activators of behavior challenges that in STAR C we look at. Um, some of these things like historical activators, we can't do anything about a lifelong long personality style or, you know, past habits and preferences. But sometimes understanding past habits and preferences <clears throat> can help us come up with a workaround in the current situation that will make uh, what we're asking the person to do more compatible with, with, with what they have preferred in the past. Or uh, understanding their personality style might help us come up with different strategies of how to uh, approach them uh, if some of our interpersonal or environmental uh, circumstances are not really uh, the best for them right now. Oh, and here's what I was talking about earlier, that it's often the case that caregivers and our star coaches really do focus on the activators, kind of what causes or triggers behaviors. But as I mentioned earlier, consequences are just as important <clears throat> and maybe even more important because there is almost always a response to the behavior. You may never know, if you weren't even in the room when a person got upset, you're not going to maybe have any idea what was the activator, the immediate activator of that upset, but you will have your response. So consequences are almost always available to us as a possible uh, position of change. 
this is just a sample of sort of a problem solving plan that uh, we came up with. So here the person, uh, Mrs. S was, uh, Mr. S was yelling at his wife when she tried to help him get dressed, looked at the four W's, what was happening before, the activators, what was happening after. And then we start trying to think about how could you change one or two of those activators or those consequences, change your response. And if you were to change that and try it for a week and see what happens, and you always, always want to look at communication as a possible activator or consequence in any difficult situation. So in the example I was just showing you, these were some of the possible ways of changing activators or consequences that Mrs. S came up with. And she circled the two that she was going to try in the next week. And hopefully she will try them in the next week. Or the behavior may not occur in the next week and she won't have an opportunity to try it. Or she may come up with a brand new idea that you and she didn't even talk about, but she understands the concept of changing activators and consequences and she makes one of those changes instead and it is either helpful or it isn't. So any of these possibilities are just fine. We're just trying to teach people and approach the process. The fourth star C core component has to do with increasing pleasant events for persons with dementia and caregivers. It's not hard to imagine that cognitive impairment leads to a loss of many pleasant activities. People aren't allowed to do things that they used to do because they're considered unsafe. They may have their driver's license taken away. They um, may no longer be welcome at the local bridge club because they're not playing as well. Uh, the family and friends may not come by as much because they don't feel comfortable with the person's, you know, changes in thinking. And so people with uh, cognitive impairment can become bored. Uh, it can certainly reduce their quality of life. And caregivers can be very helpful in identifying and implementing pleasant events for the persons with dementia and for themselves, for that matter. So we talk to caregivers about the relationship between mood and pleasant events. I mean, if you think about yourself, <clears throat> if you have a day that a lot of really happy, great things happen, then almost inevitably your mood is going to be good. And if you have a day where it's been very stressful and hard, you've been frustrated, then chances are your mood's going to be not so good. And so we want to help caregivers keep finding ways to increase pleasant events in the lives of the person they're caring for and themselves. And so you might think about what did the person like to do in the past? What does she like to do now? <clears throat> Don't assume that something that someone uh, has never tried in the past, uh, an example that I've seen several times help with persons with cognitive impairment is, is coloring. You know, nowadays we have all these adult coloring books with lovely pencils and and they're a way that people are encouraged to kind of express themselves and alleviate stress. Well, you might think I wouldn't ask my, my mother to color, you know, that would be beneath her. She's got a, a PhD in epidemiology, but it might be that she could enjoy that just as much as a, another adult would now. <clears throat> if there are things a person used to like to do, are there ways they could be modified or broken as small steps now to accommodate current abilities? I talk to caregivers a lot about safety bubbles, and what I mean by that is these are situations where the person's dementia is not relevant. You know, what's, what matters is you are with them, and they're not under any pressure to remember people or places or events or facts accurately. Uh, I think this is why, like, the, uh, uh, the Museum of Modern Art programs where, where people in like Alzheimer's groups go and they can look at, at paintings together and, and they can react and respond to them and there's no right or wrong. So these kinds of situations can be created in the home as well, where you're just spending time with someone and if they're telling a story and it's not true, it doesn't matter. What matters is that they're enjoying telling the story and being with you and you can appreciate their company. Uh, adult day programs are, are very good about providing this for a lot of people. This is something that was in, uh, developed by Drs. Terry and Logston in our group. It's called a pleasant events schedule. I, I like to show it to people not because 
<clears throat> the list of activities is, is all inclusive by any means. But what I like is to emphasize there's two sets of columns. There's a frequency and an enjoyability column. And the frequency, you're asking people for each of these items, how many times did you do it in the past month? And then the enjoyability is you're asking in the past month when the person did it, how much did they enjoy it? And I, what I think is particularly interesting are where you have examples of people who did something very little, like in this example, getting out and listening to the sounds of nature. They didn't get out at all, but they have always enjoyed that a great deal. Would there be some way, I mean, maybe the weather was cold and the caregiver didn't want to get them out. It, would there be some way to get them exposure to that, either by going outside just really bundled up or even by bringing some nature sounds in through online or DVDs to, to give them that experience. Uh, similarly, if someone uh, has been doing something a lot, maybe they're going shopping every day with their husband, and that's because they can't be left alone safely. So husband has to take her with him. But maybe she hates shopping. She's always hated shopping. And so she's always crabby when they're shopping. Would there be some way that something that she is very non-enjoyable, the frequency of it can be reduced? So you want to increase things that are pleasurable and decrease things that are not as much as possible. Uh, ABCs of pleasant events, just things to remember. Every interaction you have with a person has the potential to be a pleasant event. So pleasant events don't have to be time consuming. They don't have to be expensive. Just every time you walk past someone, putting your hand on their shoulder and saying, you know, hi, dad, you know, I like your haircut, giving mom a kiss on the shoulder, you know, a pleasant smile. Those cumulatively over the course of the day are very powerful. Uh, so anything that brings pleasure to a person's day or that brings meaning, that gives them a sense of being useful or helpful. You know, if a person wants to sweep the kitchen floor, you might not want them to sweep the kitchen floor because they don't do a very good job and you're going to have to sweep it over later. But if it gives them a sense of being helpful and contributing to the household, isn't that worth maybe more than whether the floor is spotless. So we want to kind of look for little ways to increase pleasure and meaning in a person's life. And the last star seat component to talk about is caregiver self-care. Uh, you know, caregiving is an incredibly stressful job. It has many physical, emotional, social demands. Uh, I talk to caregivers these days who are living through the pandemic and may be isolated at home with the person they're caring for, uh, outside caregivers, paid caregivers who they've been accustomed to having are no longer coming in, family members aren't coming over and helping. Uh, it's a very demanding and sometimes lonely, difficult job. And there, in many cases, are resources that are available still to help a caregiver, but caregivers either don't know about them or they're reluctant to use them, sometimes because they don't want to be a bother, uh, sometimes because they don't want to admit that they're having a hard time. And I wrote here, the system doesn't make things easy. Accessing resources, it's not like, you know, one-click shopping that you can go online and find everything you need in a single place. Our systems are very complicated in how you find what's available where. So Star C likes to work with people to try to figure out how to access these resources. And we also want to focus, get caregivers thinking about pleasant events for themselves too. You know, that relationship between mood and pleasant events is true for everyone, not just the care receivers. And are there little ways that the caregiver can get pleasant, meaningful events into their day as well? You know, could you have a phone call from your daughter every morning? to tell you what a great job you're doing. You, you, you may feel like this is contrived. Why isn't she just calling me on her own? But maybe she doesn't know how much you need it. You know, need to hear her voice, a friendly voice every day. And self-care requires respite. Respite is particularly difficult, as I mentioned this moment ago, now in these times of social isolation. And I think Many caregivers and family members and people like Starcy coaches are trying to figure out 
creative strategies to help caregivers get that sense of a break in the middle of this constant care, despite the fact that they're, they're more isolated than they were. Uh, in SARC, we provide caregivers with lists of resources. <clears throat> These are just some sample resources nationally and in Washington State. Uh, those of you uh, in other localities will, of course, have your own resources that you would be referring people to. So in summary, these are the five StarSeq tools. These are the same core components that are part of all the Seattle so protocols, back, dating all the way back to the 1980s when Linda Terry did that first study with the people who had depression and showed that behavioral interventions were powerful and efficacious in reducing depression in persons with dementia. And what her study showed was it reduced caregiver depression as well, even though the study was not targeting caregiver depression. But kind of makes sense, right? If the person with dem dementia is less depressed, the caregivers were less depressed as well. These are just some testimonials that we've gotten over the years, quotes. We, we send people in, in Washington State um, uh, surveys after they go through the Star C program and ask them what did they like, what did they not like. And it's fascinating to see of these five core components in the Seattle Protocols, not everybody loves all five. <clears throat> some people love ABC problem solving, but they just have a hard time with pleasant events. Sometimes it's vice versa. Uh, some people really embrace the communication strategies and other people are pretty good communicators already, so they're not so important to them. But this just gives you an idea that each person can resonate with one of the different components of Star C or more than one in their own way that can help make their caregiving experience and their life with the person they're caring for uh, a little bit better. So these are just a list of uh, some papers that have come out about the Seattle Protocols and the Star C program. If you're interested, you can look them up. And I think that's about my time and we have time for questions. So. Thanks so, so much. How should I do this? Should I unshare my screen now or? I can read you the questions. Okay. So the first question, um, there's, um, there's sort of related uh, qualifications for tar star C coaches, care partners, um, um, and who employs them or whether or not they'd, um, the care partners would like these coaching sessions. Is there a cost to them? Okay. So the logistics of that. Okay. So th there's several questions there. In the programs that, as they are offered in Washington and Oregon, the coaches who we have trained to do Star C have been primarily area agency on aging case managers. <clears throat> in some cases, they have been contract personnel that have been hired by the AAAs to uh, help provide services as part of their caregiver programs. So the qualifications of who people what, what might make someone eligible to be trained as a star C coach is uh, we typically ask people to have a bachelor's degree. We don't require any higher education. More important than education, formal education, however, is an understanding of what it's like to work with older adults, particularly people with cognitive impairment. We want people that have experience and that have a heart for that work, that um, love working with persons with cognitive impairment and caregivers, whether they're paid or, or family members. <clears throat> so uh, that's who's typically done the work in Washington and Oregon. Um, in, in terms of having the care receivers, care partners involved, if I understood that correctly, we typically do not recommend, in fact, we, we actually encourage coaches to not have care receivers in the room when their caregivers are doing star C sessions because it is our feeling that it makes it more difficult for the caregivers to speak frankly particularly when you're talking about things like <clears throat> breakdowns in communication 
uh, mood or behavior challenges. The caregiver wants some problem solving skills to work around, uh, ways in which the caregiver has been having a hard time. To have the care receiver sitting there and listening to that, uh, it, it could be done in a way that was respectful, but, but the Starsee program was not really set up for that in mind. So does that answer the questions you think? Mm -hmm. I've actually had several people asking um, if you could go into a little bit more detail about the, the full meaning of the dance. Oh. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> as I said, I use the acronym DANCE, and it's, it's, uh, it, it was not developed as part of the Seattle Protocols, it was just developed sort of my own, out of my own clinical practice. So D stands for don't argue. A stands for accept the disease. So you can see there's gonna be some overlaps with the star components, star C components here. Uh, A, B, C stands for creative problem solving. Uh, D, A, O, N stands for nurturing <coughs> uh, yourself and the care receiver. C is creative problem solving, and E is uh, enjoy the moment. So in a sense, they're the same five pieces as, as the uh, star C components, but they're just packaged in a way that made it easier for me to talk to caregivers in my own clinical practice uh, back in the time when I, I wrote these books. <laughs> so uh, enjoy the moment, maps on with pleasant events, creative problem solving is like ABCs, uh, nurturing yourself is caregiver self-care. Uh, A, accept the disease is realistic expectations, uh, understanding what dementia means for the person with dementia and yourselves. And D, don't argue. The most important one to remember of all. <laughs> um, so a follow-up to an earlier question. Um, uh, Linda is wondering how do you advertise to care partners to see if they are interested in this coaching? So uh, what has happened again in Washington and Oregon State is typically uh, the dyads who are identified and recruited for participation are persons who are in the caseload of the area agency, area agencies of aging. So uh, these are folks who either uh, the case managers themselves or case managers who they work with who are not involved with star c but know that this case manager has been trained in star c will refer them uh, washington state has required people to be at a certain level in t care for those of you who are familiar with that so they had to have a certain amount of either behavioral disturbance mood behavioral disturbance in the care receiver <coughs> or the caregiver had to be under a certain level of stress, reporting depression, burden, symptoms, to be eligible. And Washington State did that because even with only four sessions instead of eight, Star C is a relatively expensive and time intensive program compared to you know, something like Savvy Caregiver that's offered in groups. Or, uh, so the, uh, the state, <clears throat> encourage the triple A's to uh, be selective, to make sure that the people who they offer this program to were folks who actually they, they felt were likely to benefit from this program. There's been some downside to that. It's not unusual for caregivers who go through Star C to say, gosh, you know, I wish I'd had this two and a half years ago. Uh, you know, it would have made the last two and a half years so much easier. On the other hand, two and a half years ago, if those caregivers had been offered the program, they might have said, well, I don't need that. I'm not having any trouble. So it is kind of tricky to figure out uh, how do you find just the right persons to be involved in such a program? And I think that's something that the states kind of continually grapple with. You would think that there'd be just an infinite number of dyads out there waiting to flock to the program. But for a variety of reasons, um, that isn't always the case. Um, so wondering about um, the, what kind of a curriculum there is per se that covers the components with care partners and also what's entailed in the training sessions for the coaches, including are there costs for either? 
so uh, yes, there are costs. So again, when we're training the AAAs, typically uh, University of Washington has been paid either by the state of Washington or by the state of Oregon, who are funding this either through grants, through something like the Administration on Aging, or are just funding them through state dollars. Uh, we have offered star C to individual organizations uh, uh, at, at a like on a consultant type basis, less so because again, that can be expensive. Uh, there are online versions of star C that are being developed uh, particularly, the, well, there's one in Oregon that's in testing right now. And Kaiser, for those of you who are in areas supported by Kaiser, it has developed an online uh, version within, for, the, for Kaiser uh, caregivers that is about to begin enrollment into their randomized trial and hopefully will be successful and eventually would be available throughout the Kaiser system. So there's ways... Uh, there, there are the articles that I cited at the end of my talk. Uh, some of them go into a fair amount of detail of what is involved in Star C. So you can read those and kind of get more detail on the different components than what I talked about here today. Uh, those are the main ways it's being offered currently. And okay, um, and then. Um uh, Xiao Qing is wondering um, uh, if you could talk a little bit about um, whether or not Star C incorporates person centered care, and if so, how? Are those considerations taken into account? Well, it, I would say Star C is incredibly compatible with person centered care. I mean, when you think about what are the core components, and, and I'm, I have not gone through formal training in personal centered care, I only know about it through my reading, but the, you know, the emphasis is on the, uh, the dignity of, of the person with dementia, their participation in decision making to the extent that's possible, their respect for their preferences, uh, trying to accommodate, you know, as much as possible, their, you know, to, to their needs. Uh, so all of these things, I think, are very much part of the spirit of Star C where we are asking uh, caregivers to look at historical factors that are important perhaps in the way the person is responding here today, to look at things in the environment that may be contributing to distress or neuropsychiatric symptoms, to look at how the caregiver is communicating and responding to the person with dementia to make sure that it is that it is respectful and that it is facilitative of a better quality of life and relationship. I, like I said, those are all, we're, we're not citing person-centered care per se, but as I mentioned at the start of my talk, you know, many of these non-pharmacological strategies have developed in parallel uh, contemporaneously with one another. And a lot of them share sort of these, you know, in, in various ways, these core components, although they might talk about them in different languages, like I use the dance rather than, you know, something else. But uh, it, we, I think we are, sh what, at the heart of it, we're sharing many of those characteristics. So um, I don't have any other questions other than one concluding one. Is STAR C an acronym and what does it stand for? Oh, that's a really good question. Thank you for asking that. So uh, STAR stands for Staff Training in Assisted Living Residences. So in about the year 2000, Dr. Terry was awarded a very large grant from the Alzheimer's Association. And some of the money for that grant went into her developing STAR and showing its, which included these five core components, and and doing staff training with people who are working with cognitively impaired individuals in assisted living residences. At the same time STAR in assisted living residences was being developed, we were taking that and we're trying to use kind of lessons learned from the uh, assisted living residences to improve the 
kind of Seattle protocol approach that had been used in the depression and agitation treatment studies earlier. And so we, we wound up calling that community version STAR C, which over the years we've said, well, STAR C stands for STAR caregivers. Or sometimes we've said it stands for STAR consultants because we had community consultants that we trained to do this work. Or, you know, sometimes we said, well, it's just, you know, a, a star for being a great caregiver. So, uh, but the star part comes originally from staff training in assisted living residences. And then the C just means it's the community uh, caregiver version of that. Okay, well, I don't have any other questions. This was a magnificent presentation that covered so many aspects um, for both um, caregivers as well as helping caregivers. Um, I got a comment that it's very good information. So thank you so much, Dr. McCurry. And sure, my pleasure. That's it for today, I think. Okay, well, it was a pleasure being with all of you. I wish I could have seen you in person and, <laughs> and paced around the room with you, but uh, maybe next year. <laughs> Excellent presentation. Thanks okay. so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.